Welcome everybody. So this is OSC meeting February 27. Welcome everybody. Okay, so a few good things today. Uh, continuing on a saga. Let's look at the development team agenda February 27. Okay, so first looking at the team numbers. Uh, we're kind of down here. We kind of got this bump and going down a little bit. Uh, but it's good to track this. We're going to explode this though in a few months though uh, after we post the Hero X and, and get aligned with the book that I'm working on. So uh, good stuff. Uh, let's take a look at the second for the, at the roadmap as the first thing. So I, I'm pointing two arrows in the roadmap here. Let me share my Abe. Let me share my screen there. So uh, two things. So we're trying to really put everything on a map for the whole 12 months. Uh, with the immersion program in September, that's a big deal coming up as far as trying to scale the project, getting some enterprise happening. But two things on the uh, OSC immersion program that's here September. Uh, let me zoom in on that. So a couple, couple of notes. So we talk about distributive enterprise. Uh, Abe, would you mind taking some notes if you can? Okay, yeah. Yeah, there's the notes page on page notes. I'm going to reverse that. Yeah, uh, the distributive enterprise store. So uh, in preparing for the open source Le leadership summit in California next year, I was looking at the number of what of the tipping point for the open source economy. Okay, we've got ourselves a $78 trillion global economy. And the t tipping point theory, some papers out of Rensselaer say that it takes 10% of the population before something actually goes viral. And what would that mean for, for open hardware? And when you look at the numbers, if you look at the primary and secondary sectors, which are hardware, that's mining and manufacturing, and the third sector is services in the th three-sector theory, and now the fourth sector is coming up, which is actually the experience economy. But if we look at the three-sector theory, the first two sectors currently in an industrialized economy of America, there are 30%. Uh, but they influence fundamentally the third sector, which is, which is your services, because everything revolves around materials that the services build on. So I'm claiming, okay, let's say we have to change the first two sectors of the economy, which is 30%. And what would it take if you go through some numbers and actually talk about this a little more at length, look at my open source li uh, leadership summit talk. and That should be posted in a week or two. Um, the event didn't happen yet. But number is 900 something bil billion as the volume that we have to achieve. How do we do it? Well, we, we do, we replace common mundane objects like like uh, fuel, like a house, like a cordless drill, like a camera. We have to start making them open source. And we can do a lot of that actually right now. Let's say you have a 3D printer and some basic designs. So, so I want to introduce the concept of a d distributed enterprise store where the collaboration is upon product, open product development, but it's very directed at, at replacing commercial proprietary goods with locally produced uh, open source ones. And so there's a direct human connection to the enterprise aspect once again getting back to the rec the the financial feedback loops and any kind of development that can support livelihoods but if we do that i think um, there's a huge possibility around things that can be produced with with very basic tooling like a 3d printer a cnc circuit mill a little laser cutter and up to a torch table which are all the things and a filament maker where you can get scrap and process that into useful objects. Like for example, there's a there's an open source infrared camera out there that you can 3D print a case for. You get yourself a Pi Zero and a and a camera element and a, an IR element, and you can build a thermal camera, so forth. So there's a lot of products like that that can be can be made that are relatively simple. So it's worthwhile to uh, develop enterprise, develop a website where it's it's a networked 
uh, kind of a website, not not like a centralized platform like Amazon, because uh, Amazon is centralized, um, but a networked enterprise where people develop products and then each person can put those products on their network, like their individual node. So distributed websites like OSC could have one, Abe could have a, a node. Anyone who wants one can put that and they can put products and put up, put up a shopping basket. And they would have to, of course, have the ability to fulfill that. So if you have a 3D printer, you can print stuff out. Uh, that's a major tool. We can mill circuits with a circuit mill. We can, we can cut out little things with a laser cutter and we can pr provide parts but parts can be drop shipped for example out of amazon there's actually a thing called kit.com you can take a look at that we actually put the the refrigerator conversion so this is dorkmo thanks dorkmo uh we already set up one kit for the open source refrigerator freezer to refrigerator conversion basically the device that lets you use 10 times less power for your refrigeration needs so that's a kit.com entity things like that but basically we can develop a bunch of products and the range of those products is pretty much any consumer grade appliances and electronics little small things you know vacuum cleaners cordless drills heaters you name it I mean, a phone. You, you can build yourself a, an open source phone right now, of course, with proprietary components, but the range of products you can do is huge. So that's why around the DE store here, we've got the products we're talking about is phone, microscope, camera, drill, drone, aerial drones. Think about that for planting your aquaponic greenhouse automatically with computer vision. Film with extruders, small laser cutter, a print cluster, a print cluster. So basically a turnkey service where you can hook that up online and people can pay you to print stuff. Um, so that's the DE store, and I'm thinking about maybe in a few weeks we start another OSE developer group where we're actually having a distributive enterprise developers meeting. So there will be the plain developers meeting, and then we move into the distributive enterprise meeting where we focus more on the enterprise aspect. So that means all the aspects of the website, fulfillment, marketing, organizational, finances, all of that that's made as open source templates that anyone can borrow and not reinvent the wheel. I think that's a great idea. So so you heard it here first. I'm sure many people have talked about this, but but the the thing that we might be bringing to it is it's radically distributive, meaning that you can take the code or so our product designs, our embed codes, our procedures for how you set this thing up and so forth. So it's really turnkey to set up these stores and and as time goes on, we'll have, you know, we could develop a web platform that makes it very easy to do that. Uh, so that's, that's awesome. Basically, the open source everything store, where Amazon calls itself the everything store. We could have the open source everything store, which is networked, cryptocurrency, distributed, blockchain. So there you go. Okay. Uh, the, the other thing I added to the OSE immersion program is the D3D CNC circuit mill that actually wasn't on the on the critical path? Looks like Shane's making good progress on it, and I would like to really accelerate it. And if we need to, we'll put it on Hero X. Uh, once again, we haven't started the Hero X for the cordless drill, which I want to gather some money for that for a nice big incentive prize. Make it a a uh, a real solid reward. I mean, we're talking like a hundred k. But think about the value of that if you do a a competitive open source cordless drill that meets or exceeds industry standards that is as good or better than a Makita or whatever or a Ryobi then you, there you go and then of course it would be modular so you can interchange all the tool heads just like I think Black & Decker's got one of those that have interchangeable tool heads but that would be really sweet so think about a cordless drill that changes into a, a tiny portable chainsaw to a circular saw to maybe a little laser engraver, <laughs> whatever you got. Uh, a very multi-purpose tool. So that's the critical path and the, and the comment on that. Roadmap. Biodigester next. So, so yeah, some progress on the biodigester here. So uh, the build is happening. If you take a look at that. Uh, so installing these are, the, these are the two biodigester totes. Each is a cubic meter. 
Um, I, and John, I'd like to hear what the feedback was on the sanitation solution engineer's feedback on this. But here, what we have so far is outlets, inlets for the, the digestate, uh, or, or sorry, the feed, feed inlet. So that, that's the feed pipe going from the kitchen and bathroom. One inch, it's actively pumped by a macerator lift pump. And here's the gas out. Uh, that's the, the butt hole of this digester here. The inlet is, if you see the detail, there's a, that's the gas out pipe. The gas out pipe actually reaches all the way to the bottom, but it's got a hole. You can see that hole actually in it. That's a hole through the pipe, which where the, the gas is pretty much trapped at the top of the digester. That's where it es escapes. Um, so that you, we're looking here at the feed pipe. And here it's the actual outlet gas pipe. So great stuff there. Moving forward, hopefully gonna. Well, a goal is to finish that th this week. Aquaponic greenhouse. Hey guys, there's some stuff growing in there. The the sweet potatoes started to pipe up. Uh, so I I harvested them. So now we've got fish and sweet potatoes. So right now we could and and some greens. So we can actually, uh, if the world collapsed tomorrow, uh, I could probably live there off off like 300 pounds of fish for a year <laughs> okay but I planted those uh, the slips so we're seeding them for next year so it turns out that sweet potatoes are perennial they just keep sprouting up from old vines even if you harvest the potatoes they sp sprout from the vines which is crazy I, I didn't know that you can look at it at aquaponics log on the wiki next uh, swirl filter so so the swirl swirl filter um, Where's the page for that? Oh, here. So swirl. Here's the swirl filter. No comment there. But there's a very simple way that we can implement a swirl filter. Believe it or not, for over a year now, the aquaponic towers are all that's been filtering the water. The nutrients go through the aquaponic towers. They get eaten up by the plants. Uh, and there's the reticulated foam medium inside the towers, but uh, the water's getting pretty nasty, actually, like because the fish are growing. It's definitely cloudy. The water is getting cloudy. The fish don't have a problem. They they seem to be doing fine. But if you really s stir up the muck, there's a lot of muck on the bottom. So swirl filter would look like this. And so I was looking into what what the simplest design would look like, and we can put one right in the water so let's take t call this a five gallon bucket right here and let's draw the water surface here, here so what I'll do so here's the water it's actually gonna float on the water uh, and there's gonna be a, a small pump a very tiny pump that's just like a 80 gallon per minute five dollar pump and it has it just pumps right up here so it goes the the water goes down so it just pumps there and here's the secret the the pipe that's the outlet pipe it would be naturally below the surface of the bucket that's a five gallon bucket and a pipe is has got a uni seal down through the bottom so basically the water goes so the water level here inside so this that would spill over there that would be the water level inside the five gallon bucket uh, and then the water goes down back into the the pond so this is the pond level right there so this is just floating right on the surface of the pond so it's very non-obtrusive there is no spill leak like you want to make sure that if you have some kind of a spill you're not draining your entire pond which we've done a couple of times one time left the pump on it got totally drained because we were we were pumping from one pond to the other and all the fish were at the bottom just swimming around in a shallow pond you could that's actually how some people collect the fish but yeah we didn't want to uh, harvest them at that time we just filled it back up, but that's a danger for the walls of the, the we've got in-ground ponds that are dug with a backhoe we you don't want them to collapse they're about four feet deep uh, they can collapse and we have a little bit of collapse in the system already because of the 
we drained the water by accident a couple of times. So that's the swirl filter that's going to get built now. And basically what happens is all the, all the solids settle at the bottom and the clean water goes out the top here, this pipe. And then, uh, so you can say like, you know, the solids, they end up at the bottom here. Um, and then, so what we definitely want to have down there is if you don't want to just have a, like a little drain valve. So put, put a ball valve down here so that you take the bucket out and just drain that, drain all the muck out like every couple of days or how, how, however often that is. And it's great fertilizer. So swirl filter. Next. PVC pipe, D3D pipe workbench. Okay, yeah, so this is Ruslan. Awesome stuff here. Uh, we've got major success. So we just tried the macro and this is beautiful. So these are, we've got a, a macro called the OSC piping workbench now. Thank you, Ruslan. What you, what you see is all these different pipe fittings. And why we want that is because, for example, we can do the biodigester, which we have the full cat of. We can do that very easily. So now this is awesome. So look at this. Um, let's, let's open up a new slide here. And then go to the OSC piping workbench, select them as one one of the workbenches. You want a PVC corner? There it is, and you can select various ones, like let's say we select three quarter. Hit OK. And there you go, you got yourself a three quarter inch corner. So this is this is just great. It just makes work really easy. And we can put all these all the different fittings, all kinds of fittings here. So check that out. Ruslan Log OSC Piping Workbench. You can get all these different kinds of fittings. You can select any kind of size. We've got bushings, T's, elbows, pipe, crosses, corners, uh, reducers, and various angle elbows. Good job. Next, and then we have uh, next from Ruslan is also the the cube, the the cube within FreeCAD frame macro. So this is a macro. And this is, for example, for frames of whatever type, whatever we're using them for. We want to use them for 3D printers. And actually, one thing you can do here, uh, we talked about it last time. If the frame is not solid enough, you can pump it full of concrete. Drill a hole on one corner, in, uh, pour in the concrete, and you've got a concreted frame, which will be very, very solid. So you can see how PVC could be extremely strong. And then, of course, advantage of PVC, you can also 3D print it out of PLA or other materials, but we can start printing these frames and probably print the corners and then you can get a uh, pipe fit, just the pipe off the shelf at like a dollar or a couple of dollars for 10 feet. Uh, let's show that on, on FreeCAD. So in FreeCAD, uh, this, it's a macro, so you go to FreeCAD, Macro Menu, Macros, and you select the create frame box macro execute it okay let's get like a tiny six inch by six inch by six inch and then one inch pipe let's make it select pipe oh it's not selecting the pipe is it I think maybe the macro is not finished but um, right now we have the one inch so hit OK And it, it takes a couple of minutes, no, a few, couple of seconds, and there you go. That's our that's our pipe uh, pipe cube. Let's see how do we? It's not erasing for me. I uh, I was trying to click on it. Oh yeah, you can erase it. But yeah, so there's two cubes superimposed on one another here. But this is looking great. Um, can get your your cubes now to do it by hand would take half an hour or an hour depending how good you are maybe down as little as 15 minutes but this is this definitely uh, three seconds is better than 15 minutes for a pro okay moving on um, Abe let's uh, hear you oh yeah last Let's see, uh, we've got the greenhouse. So the CD Eco Home is going into effect. So what we want to do for this year is port the CD Eco Home out of 
Sweet Home 3D. Now, Sweet Home 3D is all full open source, and that's great. You can render in there. You can do a lot of things. You can get models, real nice looking models out of Sweet Home 3D. But for higher flexibility and a, an ability to do better design work, FreeCAD is way better because you can treat everything as an object. You can align things. You can parallelize the development once again, doing the part library for FreeCAD for the CD go home. So that's what we have. Katrina's working on that very hard. Um, the progress on documentation, we, the, the due date is end of June. So by that time, we will have the absolute full detail on a structure and the utilities of the CD Eco home. So this is great. And right now we're finishing up the biodigester. The PV is done. Uh, we got to do the whole integration of the water system and everything else. But yeah, a lot of things are done. Um, full documentation is forthcoming so that what we can do with the CD Home 2 is create a little art kit model kit that can, that can be 3d printed for actual real designs and we can have design contests maybe on on Hero X or somewhere else uh, maybe give a little prizes out but for for meaningful designs so so uh, this here is is our fully documented 1400 square foot design and all kinds of other structures. If you go to openbuildinginstitute.org, all kinds of structures can happen. Uh, next thing, Abe, uh, do you want to fill in on the on a power cube? I looked at the power cube um, here, so let me start that discussion. And it's looking quite good. So here's the power cube, and then. Let's get that frame out of there. Huh. So yeah, you can superimpose. <laughs> we'll make a power cube out of uh, PVC. Look at that. Um, oh yeah. But anyway, things are looking good here. The um, only question I had was um, the coupler length. Do we have 2.5 inches? We said three inches overall, and I'm actually not sure if it's three inches yeah. from the very front to the back. I okay. think we're missing half an inch. I think. Uh, when I sent you the three inch number, I think I said between the plates. No? Uh, between? Okay. I thought. Yeah, I think. Because I, I said three by 2.5, right? Off because it was. I know the pump is five and an eight. And when you measured from the back of the inside plate on the engine to the back of the engine, it sounded like it was exactly eight inches. So. I think I'm only like an eighth or a quarter off. I can't remember. Yeah, no, you're right so about yeah, seven. Right. That's that's exactly right. It's eight inches. Wait, is it eight inches f from the engine engine or eight inches from the plate from the plate? Oh. Yeah, from the engine inside of that yeah. plate there. Yeah. Yeah, that, right there. The plate. I think you. I think in the photo you can see it's not from the engine. It's the, the you put the tape on the inside of the, uh, oh, okay. the coupler plate. Okay, yeah, so right now. That's what the photo shows. Okay, right. So I'm right now. I'm showing like you're a quarter inch off, which is I think that's fine. It's not a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, awesome. So the only thing I can say is that if we need to, for the purpose of the the tractor, because uh, basically the idea is as soon as we get the torch table up and running, we're gonna start cutting parts because the the promise is we're not gonna build anything until the torch table is running so anyway if we have this I uh, what I could suggest for the for the tractor the 80 horsepower tractor is if we have space issues we can cut the frame off even at like this point like right here uh, and the pump would stick out a few inches out the back and that might make it feasible for things to fit in but once again we'll look at the details um, later other than that this is looking great there's a we've got the grate to which we attach the the cooler which is right there the cooler is right in front of the air intake of the fan the all the levers are accessible there's gonna be like a choke there or and choke probably like there and then fuel somewhere else so yeah, pull cord is coming out the side here. Oh yeah, so Abe, you might want to just put in a place, just a icon for the 
the pull cord. The pull cord is out of this face right here. That's where the pull cord comes out. Um, on the, this face on right, the right there. Side. Well, the okay. one I highlighted, which is green, that's where the pull yes. cord is. Um, this is looking good. You got, uh, so I guess we're missing the blocks, for the little rubber mounts. Yeah, I was looking for those in the spreadsheets, the bomb or something, but I hadn't found those specifically. But I think they're about an inch, so... Yeah, they're about an inch, and they're, and they're solid, so we just drill through them with a drill. Yeah. Oh, okay, so they're, they're like a hard rubber. Yeah, 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 they don't even have a hole in them. Uh, okay. Yeah, and that's something, actually, this is, once again, 3D printing. I mean, all that kind of stuff, instead of making it a line item in the in the bill of materials it's a line item in the 3d printing yeah. list which is much easier because you don't have to worry about supply chain issues all you got to do is make sure you've uh, got your 3d printers and filament so that's that's awesome yeah. and that's that's further that's parts that we can be selling once again in the distributive enterprise OSE market and the in the open source everything store Oh, we gotta we gotta write that down before anyone takes that. The open source everything store. Um, this is how you protect stuff. When you publish it, now it's forever uh, claimed as this is the first place this this has been said. If it is, um, I don't know if anyone said that before, but when we publish this on on YouTube. The video has a timestamp, and that's proof and record that that term, at that point, it may not be trademarkable. Or or if, if somebody tries to trademark, I don't know if they can, but if it's used like that, if it's in public, then typically you can't trademark things that are public, but people do that anyway. Um, anyway... Um, I think open source everything store. That's a nice, nice deal. So uh, that's 3D printing. Uh, hey, yeah, co continue on, on uh, other stuff, other power cube. Yeah, let's see. power cube. Let's see, is that the latest cat? Okay, so uh, you see the pictures I've got. Um, yeah. I should probably share my screen. Uh, do that. Window. Right. Okay, so yeah, I've ended up getting the different parts of the cube. I put the better first stage. So I've done small valves, and I'm going to start trying to get some of the plumbing sorted out. Uh -huh. so I, let's see, I redid the top here, but I noticed before I was having that issue with uh, constraining some of these fittings in there, and that's because I was constraining these fittings to the holes in this thing, and every time I uh, I don't know if it's ed editing the, the original sketch, I, I think is what causes issues with the constraints. I'm going to have to constrain stuff a little differently and really experiment with uh, plumbing. Yeah. There's a lot of it. Oh, wait. Hold on a second. you got to... Uh, just one thing. that You've got this... Hold on, hold no. on. Hold on, Abe. Can you hear me? There's a... Uh, I think you've got the... If that's the... Yes. Filler, that needs to be on top. That's the filler. It's not an, a uh, liquid tight seal. That needs to go on top. Oh. Dude. It's all down here on the side. It's just floating. Oh, okay, yeah. Um. Yeah, I haven't. Um, I, I'm going to make that. Uh, I think, as we talked about before, the. Uh, the fill hole the cap and everything it needs to be made with a uh, part so it yeah detail. yeah we, we uh um yeah although it's turn it on the plumbing um that that shouldn't be that difficult i think it's just a few pieces of a uh, certain size of NP yeah yeah uh, fill vented fill cap um so that cylinder can uh, I'll just replace it with something else um yeah Oh yeah, the yeah. Plumbing, sorry, that's just sitting there. Uh, I think is a good issue because it might change um, certain issues with the size of the. I want to make sure I'm not getting the frame too small. Although ideally, these pretty small be the uh, look at 
at the life track and how they fit on there before. I think you saw that, and um, it, it it's kind of an odd, difficult way to to fit all on there. So, um, I, well, I think I'm gonna, you know, there's got to be plumbing that goes up and down and side to side, and it depends on which where the position of the cube is. So. Um, For that, we have to look at the actual tractor and see how all the cubes fit these, in there. Uh, yeah, so the pins, I think, around higher and maybe, well, they can't, some of these are able to fit around the pump. Of course, I know when you put the plumbing together, it can be, you can kind of turn, you know, adjust the, the angle of the handles, but. I know you're saying two that could cut off the handles, but you can trim it in half. You know, whenever you need to actually shut them off, you're going to have to get some kind of tool in there, probably to, to you know, anyway. And if there's a bunch of holes in the way, that that's still going to be a problem. So I yeah, you don't want to different angles and positioned. Um, you don't want to cut the handle all the way off. If, right, I, I don't think it'll you, be too much of a problem. If you cut the handle halfway, yeah. you can still turn it manually. So, but it like as it is, it's super long. But right. if you cut a couple of inches off it, it, it would make yeah. it fit. Uh, I've got one comment here also on the top yeah. uh, and bottom frame pieces. Uh, you added a strip at the bottom piece, and is that to protect the the valves? I had that strip in there before, and what I decided too was that this bottom piece just needs to be redesigned because we're probably, you know, there might be options for hoses going down to the cube below and things like that. Well, Plus, um, the handles might need to be positioned down where they turn down yeah. a little bit there. Well, these might, the suction things might need to be moved up so that the cutoff handle's clear. Yeah. Um, well, the idea there is, hoses. yeah, we could. Uh, the easiest thing right now is, yeah, remove that bar. We don't need that at all. I don't. I don't think we do. Yeah. I think if you just remove okay. it, that will fix the bottom. And note that the bottom piece is in one piece, in that it's the tank is part of the the frame. If you look at the top of the frame, the top, I notice that you have multiple pieces. That needs to be one piece. So if you tilt up. Uh, tilt the top piece, oh, show the top pieces. piece. Yeah, I see you've got three pieces oh, the for the top. Yeah, well, make that just, actually, no, I mean two pieces. Make it one piece. Yeah. It is actually. Oh, it is uh, one piece, piece, but it's just select, slightly. But, so, ah. but I haven't redrawn the, uh, okay. that tank wall there. Okay. Because uh, whenever I do that, it undoes all the plumbing constraints. So I've, yeah. I've just got to go back and connect differently yeah that's, yeah that's at the end yeah you can fix it and those little quarter inches on the edge that actually will be very important to get very accurate because once we cut out with a torch all those pieces you can't have little gaps anywhere they, they have to fit pretty perfectly but yeah otherwise that's looking pretty good yeah yeah and one thing I was worried about too is that I put in the you know, on the top on both these cubes, I put in these little hook points. Yeah. But I'm wondering how balanced that thing is going to be to lift. So I'm thinking either a third hook point. But I know that's good. Well, if you get it, too. I can tell you um, if you get it in the center of gravity, that will be pretty decent. Uh, so yeah. you can start. I don't know if FreeCAD has the capacity to calculate FreeCAD uh, center of gravity. I haven't. It probably does. Or if it doesn't, we should. Uh, make that happen <laughs> yeah I guess it the engine is probably heavier uh, than the hydraulic fluid although let's see that's how many right. uh, we got about 10 gallons yeah, in there 10 gallons times 8 pounds so it's like yeah. 80 pounds plus the steel the engine itself is like a hundred so it's it's about equal yeah actually okay yeah and that could be pretty balanced um, yeah, that was the other thing on the, the bottom of the frame. Just take that bar in the middle of the back out. I was trying to decide how to re maybe redraw that for bracing because I don't know if the engine is going to flex down on that. I could draw that with a different pattern that might make that stronger so it doesn't tend to bend the no, I mean, it's, frame because most of the weight is 
Right? Yeah, you know, I don't think point, I don't think you have to worry about it. I mean, it's been pretty good with what we have right now, and right now we just have that frame piece there and it seems to be okay. perfectly fine and in fact if it vibrates yeah. a little bit that's further shock absorption so it's fine yeah 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 okay, okay. all right yeah let's see um yeah i think the, the main cube is the one that let's see i'm mostly working on i think most of the, the smaller cube there isn't much to do there other than and, and oh yeah, and know, also more, get rid of that. Pieces there too, but. I'm seeing also in a small power cube, you've got that bottom piece. We don't need that piece there either. That yeah. supporting okay. piece that that can yeah, go. I can eliminate that there too. Uh, so um, what are what do you think are yeah. your next steps here? One thing I wanted to ask is, uh, so did you actually create a burn down for this that we can actually track the burn down? Because I think what we should do at this point, since we're getting pretty close. Um, let's see. So it's it's called Power Cube. What what do we got there? Eighteen oh one for the small one. Uh, eighteen oh one. Yeah, eighteen oh one. Eighteen oh one is the smaller one. Yeah. Seventeen eleven so, is the large. Have you seen how we do the? Oh, there's. It's very easy actually. Look at burn down. The so there's a page on the wiki. There's a page on the wiki called burn down. So. Uh, it's basically on an OSC dev page, but it shows you how to embed a burn down based on your your graph. Can you do that? And let's actually try to track track uh, the completion of okay. a project. So you've got a couple of things filled in already, but do do add that. And then what I'd like to see is uh, actually try because the power cube. I mean, we've built so many of them. Power cube and brick press are perhaps the largest number of prototypes. Um, so we can get to the point where we actually fill in this entire table and actually draw up a, a full manual for that. So we can do perhaps some kind of a design sprint at some point. But the first thing is to actually fill in all the aspects of this so that someone can take this and really understand it. Um, and then we can publish that. We can publish a design guide. So, for example, like in a design section, there's really not really a, uh, like a design guide section, but on, under conceptual design, we can put in the actual design guide where we teach people how to design the whole power cube, including how you do the basic calculations and everything else. And then uh, in the design part, the thing that, that we can do later, just like we have the, the workbench for the piping, we can do a workbench for power cube design where you pull off all the components that we use and that way anyone can design a power cube just turn key which is going to be a great contribution so anyone can build it uh, they can cat it up if people have a 3d printer they can print little 3d models of it if they have the small laser cutter they can cut the steel parts so what i'm driving at is uh when we get the 3d printer with the very small laser cutter basically we can prototype fully uh, like when remote people can prototype these machines fully but for that it's actually important that we would print like like have real detailed or sufficiently detailed part library part parts for the entire power cube so a person can make not just like a 3d print of the whole thing but if it's got a fitting on it, you actually print, maybe even print the fitting um, independently. So you can simulate with 3D printing, you can basically do the whole build of a power cube for an instructional, like right on your desktop. And that way, that way you can do, instead of requiring a, a, wor a heavy metal workshop like we have here, we can get people prototyping remotely with 3D printed parts and laser cut parts which where the laser cut parts stand for the parts we would otherwise cut out of steel out of flat steel like here the quarter inch so this is completely doable for remote prototyping and also just like we can do prototyping of the CD cajon once we build the OSC, OSC kit the arc kit for the CD cajon so there's a lot of uh, exciting things we can do for prototyping and then get more people involved and 
just kind of start snowballing this whole thing so that when we we fill out the build instructions for example the people who are prototyping with the 3d models and laser cuts they can build a whole instruction set where they can even take pictures of that simulating the whole build and then we can verify whether that build actually goes as planned so that would be a great great way to accelerate the prototyping part uh, so that would be awesome but yeah let, let's uh, please put in uh, the burn down and uh, let's take a look at it next week how that works because right now the burn down is populated automatically whenever you fill in a number in a third column from 1 to 10 like right now you're at 12 percent it goes automatically into the burn down table uh, the graph to generate that so that's really good that's an automated thing we don't have to worry about creating that and updating that that's all automated and we want to create a whole infrastructure of automated aspects where this just becomes the whole development process really becomes super uh, super slick and optimized to the point that we can add some AI to it uh, start putting in elements where if things are structured and well defined you can start AIing it start putting in automation on top of the process just like you know a simple example with automating the generation of the burn down graph and things like that so for example you know just just as an example um, think of an AI that would take our library parts and we could teach it to actually co compose the power cube by itself I mean I, I think that's forthcoming that's definitely a hard programming challenge but uh, you know we can think about something like that for the future so anyone who's in AI doing that listening to this uh, help us out on that I mean this is just I mean all this stuff as we go towards the singularity I mean we're all this stuff is gonna get AI'd artificial intelligence is gonna start doing it um, that's why people gotta get skilled up and sim symbiose with symbiotize with with computers instead of getting replaced by them so it's all about increasing human ability with robotic symbionts so beyond that, anything else on this, on the power cube, Abe? Because we should wrap up. I think, let's see, I think, I think that's about it that I can think of now. Okay. Um, let's see, do I have other notes on my... Um, yeah, that... A lot of details coming in all parts. Yeah. Going back. Yeah. So try to, let's see. Uh, it's on the concept. Yeah. So let's, let's see, for example, okay, so along with the 3D CAD, let's see, where's our, I'm looking for a part library. So we should be putting, do we have a power cube parts library somewhere? Because that should really go under the 3D CAD. Uh, the 3D CAD should link to a page, whether it's on this page or elsewhere, where we've got the both the, uh, the full CAD and then all the individual parts. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I see the CAD here. It's the, the full file that you have. But for the purposes that I just described, for example, like people doing 3D models and actually prototyping it remotely by 3D printing, which that depends on on us having a full part library and actually think about that that could actually be a product that goes into the open source everything store people can make little toy models where they build their own power cubes like crazy power cubes with like 10 engines in them so so this will definitely be for educational purposes and prototyping involving kids and and really uh, making it go forward but that depends like the real key like number five 3d CAD the full CAD plus the part libraries are one of the most critical things and imagine once we start getting structure to the 3D CAD that's where you can put the artificial intelligence on top of that I mean for example oh man I mean look at this right now holy cow I mean we can start applying AI right now like for example with the image recognition like for example if you if you put the AI on have it crawl our wiki pages with you know individual page for each you know whatever each uh, library part the AI can actually tell you what it is so it can annotate or or like someone you know someone's who's new to it they can actually 
get information on AI could actually help us right now. Like if somebody doesn't know what this part is, like the ball valve, the AI would actually tell you because you can train it. And th that kind of capacity, actually, believe it or not, I just looked at it very briefly, but it's get it's out there. Very simple libraries in Python. Uh, look at the, let's see, let me just point people at that. Um, it's on my log. I put it on as, let's see, artificial. Uh, I was looking at that like yesterday, a couple of days ago. Let's see. No, I'm in 2017. Let me go go back up a year. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, it's a uh, particular open source open AI. Uh, Okay. Software for AI. Okay, so there's look at the page called Open Source AI on the wiki, and then uh, look at existing open source designs of software. So there's a list at datamation.com. Um, nice tutorial at TensorFlow. The one I was looking at, uh, machine learning library for Python executable through simple programs yeah the computer vision applications that one image recognition I think the image recognition is what I just referred to if you just have a little simple Python script scraping your wiki pages once you have the images of the of the part libraries and it you know it can I start identifying things and then when it, when it can identify things I mean that's so powerful because at that point you can say that you do a program that says, okay, if you find a pipe and a, a ball valve, screw them onto each other. You know, so yeah, we can start getting uh, artificial intelligence CAD, CAD design happening pretty quickly here. Uh, I think what, I, what would be relevant, I think, is the image recognition here. So I'm going to highlight it with bold. Yeah, well, this is awesome. So, so anyway, uh, that underscores the importance of the full part library. Let's nail this for the power cube, and we're gonna get Tom Griffin, Griffin, on that. Uh, he's our power cube lead. He's in the background and he's learning FreeCAD right now. But we're gonna we're gonna look at doing a, another micro uh, solar power cube workshop, which is very relevant. So. Uh, he can join in on this part library effort and I really want to get the kits out there and uh, uh, some products around the power cube like just, let's put that on the open source everything store so we can uh, people can produce them and we can pr provide parts and things like that does that sound good can we wrap up at this point yeah yeah that sounds good I'll, excellent uh, some of that open source uh, AI software. I think I looked at some of this, like TensorFlow, yep. once before a little bit, or some educational information on that. So uh, I mentioned a lot of that. Uh, so yeah, that uh, we should yeah. look at. Yep. Uh, I actually have a couple of questions here. I'm looking at the 45 cubic inch motor. Now, was that fully catted up for for the tractor? Because I just saw we had an email exchange where I provided all the dimensions. Is that fully catted up? Because uh, it's not related to the power cube, but it's related to the big tractor. Uh, oh, the uh, the big motor, the hydraulic yeah. motor. Yeah. Um, let's see. You know, I think I was looking at some of that. Or did Roberto actually do that already? Technical parts of that. I don't think I worked on that one, but I saw some CAD for that. I don't know if it's up to date. Um, because it looked like different motors were listed or maybe some older ones. Well, at least I noticed that the motors that were listed that were that big weren't on, uh, they weren't available on um, uh, oh, yeah. Center or yeah, something yeah. like that anymore. It was, it was different. They, they have some, I think, that are kind of that size, but I, yeah. I don't know if you have existing parts you want to reuse. or. Yeah, actually uh, what happened uh, to fill in on that, why we like that one, 
we actually bought a whole bunch of them a few years ago so we still have we have about 12 of those so we're going to continue working on those are really good they're very strong uh and we're basically going to go with those until we can build them like um because i mean they're high precision uh not so easy to build but once you get the cnc machining up we got to start making them because it's the perfect case where it's like these things appear and disappear or might be too expensive off the normal supply chain so of course we we start uh making our own parts but i do see uh Roberto did that some time ago, so I'm just going to download that right now. Um, yeah. Open that up. I think I live a while back for some reason. Uh, working on the tractor, maybe. Yeah, I know we had that. Uh, I'm just taking a look at it. It's uh, November 20, 2017. Um, let's see what the status of that was. Uh, how good that looks because it's one of those things we really want to see where did it show up was it showing up ah okay here yeah that actually looks quite good it looks like uh yeah 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 no that looks pretty accurate i'm just looking at just kind yeah. of the main yeah that one does look yeah, it's missing the fittings, so models. yeah, we definitely want to add the fittings to that. But yeah, that looks that looks great. Because um, yeah, we're gonna need to uh, like when we do actually real design, we want to make sure these files are pretty accurate. And a, a cool thing once again would be when we three D print it and build it according to this model, we can test how it fits in a three D printed laser cut model. And that will tell us more information off the CAD, because in CAD all the time, there's little things that can be missed. So we basically got to shake down the both the CAD and our ability to use the CAD to the point that whenever we are doing a design, that design always matches reality. I mean, that's, I mean, that's of course obvious, but it's not as easy as you think, because you don't, sometimes you don't have the parts available uh the parts might be a little different i mean the supply chain issue once again the critical uh biggest threat to any success is the the variable supply chain um and then the other thing is if you look at uh one more comment uh, i made some comments about uh cat scans there's open source tool chains where you can actually open source uh, there's open source computer uh processing from cern as well as another open source guy who who did uh, uh, basically CAT scans, taking photographs of X-ray images that bounce off uh, like the cassette, the like the phosphorescent cassette that they use. So it's a very low cost way. You get yourself a, an X-ray source, and you can do in, interior reverse engineering. You don't have to break the thing apart. It actually gets a three-dimensional CAT scan basically getting you the three-dimensional internals of mechanical devices that's pretty insane and um, we could uh, we should definitely take that up at some point because looking at 3d scanning yes outside we can reverse engineering these things and we should work on a photogrammetry but also it's important that we can look at the things like if you want to reverse engineer this let's cat scan it because we've got these we don't necessarily want to open them up uh, let's get the insides with x-rays that that's a really crazy thing uh, one last thing here we see uh, so John is actually doing some good stuff here update um, let's just redo that so yeah we're, we we were doing a run out sensor for the filament uh, so he's got a 3d printer that he's getting up and running we'll part print parts for D3D. He's building a PVC frame version. Um, ordered all the parts for for that. Start to model the PVC D3D. Yeah, so, so one of the things, uh, the final things for John 
is that we get a good, really good working model for the PVC version so that it's accurate and it has the Prusa i3 MK2 extruder on it and that way people can don't have to replicate the figuring out of things like where exactly do you have to drill holes or do you have to move the bed over a little bit. I mean that's all we gotta just really nail that. So yeah John it would be great if you can continue on a CAD um, of that and also John if you don't mind just like with uh, the burn down page on the wiki insert yourself a um, a de development template and a burn down for this build so that would be great and then Michael he's uh, our senior sys admin doing background work fixing OSE main working on some media wiki stuff we're, we're basically porting t uh, our website to a new server that's much faster um, yeah, so we're moving forward on that. He basically beefed up our infrastructure to do things like from HTTP to secure HTTP, meaning HTTPS, installed some two-factor authentications. The, the thing that he's ending up with is actually installing Jitsi Meet so we can do large webinars off our own servers. So that's that's the end point of his work. Yeah, but that's, that's about it. So anything else, Abe, or we're good here? I think I think that's good. Um, Excellent. I can see the 3D printing of models being really useful for uh, checking. The Absolutely. And all that. So. Oh yeah, yeah. And that way, you know, we got to get you a printer out there, and then you can when you when you design this, then you can actually be verifying the part fit, like, or even, yeah. um, you know, think about even even this. What if we take we do the actual 3D print, and then just compare it to the real part. Like or even like, in the actual build, use the fake part. Like for example, if there's the the valve there, just use the fake part to see if it fits exactly as it should. You know, so we can do a lot of a lot of pre-testing. That's called test-driven design. Before we make the full working thing, we test everything about uh, the build that we're making. And, that, and that's that's what uh, extreme manufacturing is about. It's a part of that is. That one of the cores of extreme manufacturing is test-driven design, where you're testing it, you're designing tests, so that you don't end up finding out all that's wrong in a final build. You solve all those issues before the final one. So, yeah, that'll be awesome. So let's continue. Uh, thanks a lot, then. Yeah, uh, I'll quit the recording right here, and please watch this if um, if you need to review some more things from the meeting. We covered a lot of good stuff. Okay, thanks a lot.